Hello, everybody. I'm really glad to be here. I'm really stoked. So let me just uh, share for a second the screen and we'll get started. So um, hello again. Really exciting to be here. My name is Luca. I work uh, daily as a machine learning engineer at Extreme. Uh, by night, uh, I'm a open source maintainer of this amazing project called Funktime. Um, I find myself in a great, wonderful position where I can do two of the things that I love the most. The first being polars, I'm a huge polars nerd, and also time series forecasting. And so today I would like to guide you through uh, how we built uh, Funktime, which is this uh, forecast library and time series library built on top of polars entirely. And though the focus would be mostly about time series forecasting, I do believe there is a lot uh, for the people who also happen to be machine learning engineer in, or machine learning practitioners in general. Uh, because the point about funk time is not so much about uh, how to do time series forecasting, but it's more about how I think that polars will be able to enable a new generation of machine learning libraries. So without further ado, um, let's get started. And as usual, I would only leave the code. This uh, slideshow is displayed with a wonderful project called SlideDev, and you will find everything, uh, including the code for this presentation, uh, on this GitHub repository. So let's get started. What we'll be talking about today, it's a lot, but I think we can chew through it. First of all, our case study, our use case, the problem with forecasting, So, or actually why we chose to address the problem and why Polos was the perfect tool to handle forecasting. Um, and then we'll see how from time tries to solve and actually address and hopefully solve this problem. And with two key ingredients, the first one being Polos and the second one being global. I will dig into a bit into the details of both, but don't worry, it won't get technical at all. But you will have a lot of references to talk about. It. Then we will enter the most dangerous part of this whole presentation, which is seeing a forecasting workflow in action, which means a bit of live coding. So just fingers crossed, okay? And finally, we will see a bit of the diagnostic tools that Funtime offers, as well as a bunch of references uh, for those who want to uh, dig deeper. So let's get started. Let's talk about forecasting. Um, I did not come up with this. It's a quote from an article of Mike Gilliland, who is a, on the board of director of the International Institute of Forecasters. Forecasting is an expensive process, and improving on it is um, extremely costly and often doesn't yield the expected results. The point about this is that forecasting has always been the work of a tailor, or if you want to think about it, it's a bit like taking care of a pet. You need to uh, carefully analyze the residuals, or you need to um, inspect a lot of properties, standardize the time series, or detrend it, or take differences. It's a, a really delicate thing. and it works. I mean, it has to be done this way if you do univariate forecast. But if you need to work on multiple time series, I would say even ten. This cannot be done so thoroughly every time. So forecasting is expensive in this sense. The, the process of forecasting can become really inefficient when you have to deal with thousands of time series, let alone, I mean, even hundreds or dozens of time series would be more than enough for one person to handle. And so the cost of forecasting scales really quickly, um, not only in terms of a process, but also in terms of scalability. How can we run a million, or how can we fit a million of ARIMA models on a million different time series and optimize those. That's a real challenge, right? And so the point that the author makes is that uh, we need to change the focus that we um, use to zoom in on forecasting. Actually, we need to do the opposite. We need to zoom out and think of forecasting not as a matter of achieving a certain accuracy, but rather going from model building to the whole process and make it efficient. So Funtime wants, uh, is an attempt to solve this problem using um, the two technologies I spoke about before, which are global forecasting and polars, with a really specific aim. We do not want to offer a tool that will enable, um, right now at least, people, for example, looking at Spotify to forecast uh, uh, the number of people listening to a certain song, every possible song they do have, okay? That's a really problem with scale. We want to focus on the reasonable scale, on the 90% workflows that people will be involved in. And so, for example, this will mean that we might want to be able to run a thousand of time series, perhaps even locally on your laptop, without resorting to distributed systems such as PySpark. So right nowadays, with any uh, cloud provider, you can access really powerful virtual machines that you can use, and we want to be able to 
um, let people use funk time on such virtual machines and be able to scale to thousands or even more time series at once without using distributed systems. The second thing is offering a meaningful API for feature extraction and diagnostics that will be compatible with panel datasets natively, and we'll see this in due time. And finally, we won't be able to, uh, since we don't have to scale to production, to translate smoothly from experimentation to production itself. And these are the two key ingredients that we want to, that we think can be used to achieve this goal. So let's talk a bit about Polars. Uh, for those who've lived under a rock for the past year or two, Polars is a wonderful data frame library with a multi-threaded query engine written in Rust, but offering key bindings in a lot of languages, uh, Python included, of course. And so let's break this down. Let's break this down a bit. Uh, it is a data frame front end. It's not a SQL table. Okay, it's in process and uses all core on your machine efficiently, which means it doesn't just simply use the core. It allocates the jobs of a query across all cores so that the process always like the process is always using as much RAM as it can to finish your work sooner. And also as um, a query engine that leverages 50 years or even more of relational database literature to build out query in a very efficient manner. And this is unlike libraries such as Pandas, uh, which for example, for this query, um, for that we'll see afterwards, do not do optimization and operate in an eager manner. Polars leverages la lazy optimizations to simplify your query and just read the data that it needs to or um, do the least work as possible. Polars is so fast because of three ingredients. So the first one being using Apache Arrow, a really popular, um, I think like basically a standard for data manipulation of representation of data in memory that enables really fast uh, input output of files and data. Second, these work stealing, AKA the efficient multi-thread. And finally, the query optimization. If you look at this query, for example, in Pandas, what will happen is that if a call happened to be calling sort on a certain column and the head for just displaying the first five rows, um, Pandas will have to go through the column and sort everything, including the other columns, perhaps. Uh, what Polars is capable of doing when operating in lazy mode and seeing this is that it just needs to sort, seek for the first five elements. Basically, let's just put it like in a really simplified term, just call max five times um, to retrieve the top five and sort those, only those and not everything else. And this is extremely powerful because it enables um, a, a levels of speed and data management that were unthinkable before going to Postbox. Mm -hmm. Polars makes it able to scale and put lower, actually, put, go so through with your ceiling that you will be able to work with terabytes of data. Uh, not even, maybe not in a local machine, but definitely in the virtual machine without needing to resort uh, to Postbox. And let's go to the second ingredient, which is global forecasting. And global forecasting might sound intimidating, but it actually is just one plain, very simple thing, fitting just one model on all of your data. How about, how expensive could it be to run and fit a million time series, a million ARIMA models on one million time series? Very expensive. What if we just do one model on the whole data? And you say, hmm, sounds interesting, but does this work? And it turns out in the scientific literature and especially forecasting competition, this approach has proven successful for the past at least three to four years. So there is an incredible amount of literature covering these global models that mostly fit gradient boosted regression trees to achieve optimal performance. And it might not be the best performance. Sometimes it is, but it is like an acceptable level of performance. Keep in mind, we're talking about the process. We're not talking about the result. The process is part, the result is part of the process, but we need to optimize the whole thing. And so why we might also resort to gradient boosted trees, if we do some clever and deliberate feature engineering, we might even just go away with uh, linear models. And so here's the recipe for fuck time. A powerful query engine that is Polars, uh, used to blazingly fast feature engineering followed by a single call to a model that fit. So a thin layer of abstraction that allows you to call a lot of um, models and uh, just fit them all at once, just fitting one model on whole data. 
And here is the tricky bit. So at this link is the same one at the repository I shared, uh, let your code of the repository, you will find a bunch of things. So the code of everything, the code of the repo compre including uh, the lights, but here you will also find a reference to funk time, of course, the official repo and uh, tools code for this notebook that if you click on any of these three will bring you to uh, a space like um, a virtual notebook environment where you can run the code. Uh, they will mostly require you to sign up uh, or um, to download external packages, have an account on the platform. Uh, I chose Kaggle, just, uh, oh, there we go, continue editing, just because uh, I found it to be like the, the most pleasant in terms of UI. And uh, I will like, I will not go through everything, of course, and I would like to slow this down, but for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I would like you, to, I would like to show you Funk Time, not in action, but see how the, um, API looks and how familiar it might be and the kind of tool that it offers. Uh, this is because after me, in a couple of days, there will be Funtime's creator, Christopher, as well as Matthew, who will be doing like a 90 minute tutorial uh, where they will guide you through how to properly use Funtime for a forecasting workflow. They will explain in great detail how to use uh, um, polars and how um, profound the integration is, but also how uh, we rebuilt uh, TS Fresh, which is an historically famous feature extraction library using Polars to achieve impressive speed. Up. And we also use the Polars plugin written in Rust. So that's going to be a juicy one. But so let's get ahead of ourselves and just think about Funk Time. Um, Funk Time is a nice library that just run all maybe in the meantime and see what the error comes out. It's a nice library that can be pip installed very easily, but it has a lot of optional dependencies because we want to, to be able to deploy a model without bringing in a lot of complex dependencies. Dependencies in the data science do weigh a lot, right? So we don't want you to bring to production like a, a just seven, 800 a gigabyte of dependence. So um, while scikit-learn, for now at least, comes bundled, uh, you do not have, you will not have to, you have to optionally to opt in to install, for example, like GBM to fit the model. Um, and here we see for a very simple data set and you will see how many observation it has inside. Uh, but I would just want to show you the only constraint that we put and the assumption that we make as funk time users, which is that the data set should have this shape which is uh, the first column is often called the entity column that contains a unique identifier for the time series. The second one is a time column, could be time or daytime, no matter, uh, that represents the time the observation was taken. And finally, the target column. After those, it can be uh, as many features as you want, uh, many static features. But for the moment, we do not support, for example, multiple targets, uh, especially because you can just explode them to another series below. That's the basic concept. This is what we call a panel data set. Uh, maybe because that come from economics or econometrics and we used to call it like those. And you see that they're peculiar shape, but they're basically, um, they're not wide, they're long data formats. And the only assumption that we make is that the columns are represented in this order. So we usually keep to restore those so that we can use them around. And we need to set just before a couple of constants. The first one is the frequency you realize that you might have a uh, serious data with different granularities and you might want to uh, forecast, for example, a daily model out of uh, data observation that would take a minute or so. So Funk Time can handle for you this kind of aggregation so that you can only um, use the same interface and you don't have to do any manual aggregation to um, fix different models for different time horizons or um, different frequencies. And the second one being the forecasting horizon. The data we're using is uh, data about commodity prices and it's taken monthly. So if we just pick up a forecasting rate of four observation, it will return to a quarter. And here we see how Funk Time can help you. We have a set of plotting function that can allow you, that allow you to display at a glance uh, lots of time series at once. And so the plot entity this function allows you to see using Plotly as a backend, which is the only one that we support currently, all the distribution of the data. And you can start seeing how unbalanced it can be. But global forecasting can kind of work with these observation too, even though uh, like heterogeneous data sets. Another thing that we can do, 
And right now, we have to do manually, but until in next release, it will be made option. It will be offered as a feature is to display just a sample of those series. So if we set a seed and select K, where K is the number of time series we want to display, we can just do a bit of a magic with polars and cast them into a concrete data set that we may use to um, filter the observation and pipe them into our plotting function so we can display uh, a sample of the time series at once. Keep in mind that this data set contains 70 observation and this poses a real challenge right from the very beginning. How do you analyze those features at once? And yes, you could just sample those and see how they behave and possibly zoom in, of course, but uh, isn't there a way, a better way to do so? And it turns out we tend to offer it and it is called, uh, um, we can either perform it by hand this will become open a feature in the next release, for example, where we can go to sort or just select the top case uh, observation or time series actually, based on a certain uh, metric. Here we use the coefficient of variation, which is a really common metric. But basically it's just the, the ratio between the standard deviation and the mean of an observation. And we can sort um, the time series in our panel and just return the top six and see that this starts to make a bit more sense. We can find the one that have uh, the highest coefficient of variation, so the one that behave less like well than the others. If we assume that this is like a decent uh, exploratory analysis for five minutes or even less that we've been talking about this, we can move on to the proper forecasting workflow. And here is where we see that how we strive to uh, retain compatibility with the second learning API, just to make sure that people are comfortable with all we, as they were with Circuit learn as well a bit long time. So we provide a train test split that splits the data in a training and test set. But the most astute of you might have wondered, well, but the train test split, like how it does it operate, right, on multiple time series? And the, the answer is we do this ourselves. And if we collect the test set, we see that we op we made the split on the forecasting horizon. Remember that we split on the, basically the last four observation for this example. We just took aside the last four observation on every time series. So you did not have to do any aggregation. And this is like a, a common theme for also yeah. fang time operation. We abstract away the need from for you to aggregate your data, striving to offer a scikit-learn like API that works out of the box for panel data sets. This doesn't mean that you cannot use time series data like when you have a univariate one, but uh, fang time is especially suited for dozens of ten series or hundreds of ten series at once. Fun time also has a set of uh, naive forecasters that are really useful, especially useful um, in the forecasting field because usually a naive model is just surprisingly hard to beat, right? But you can see that when you clear those, it's fairly simple, fairly, it looks familiar to what we used to. And the interface is the same one where we call fit and predict on the train and the not so called test data set, but where uh, the input to the predict function is the forecasting rise. And if we call head, you will see that the prediction have the same representation and just um, we're forecasting put in order. So once again, fun time handles this for you. This is all good, well and good, but let's talk about the juicy bit, diagnostics, because we want to be able to analyze the cost all at once. Okay. And if we look at those, we have some utility function, again, um, that will feature okay. in the next release, like a sampling function, but for the moment, we'll just do a bit of a blur's wizardry. Um, we can have a plot function. We have a function that is called plot forecasts that allows you to uh, display all the forecasts at once, you, so you can see the error and the original value. We do the alignment of timestamps ourselves, so you don't have to think about it. But as we said, once again, how can we evaluate those functions systematically, right? Because here we can just sample them and for sure we cannot see a million, maybe not a million, but a thousand time series at once would be just hard to eyeball. So we offer um, an evaluation module with a function called rank point forecast. And in the future, we will also have like a rank uh, into forecasting interval probabilistic forecasts so that you can uh, um, rank your every time series according to a certain error metric. And then you can plot those and see here, for example, that with how um, the naive forecast that performs, and especially we can pick out the six worst 
time series with, well, actually, yes, the six worst set of prediction out of these naive forecasts. This starts to be better, but we will see a better approach later down the line. But I think now it is the proper time to introduce electric proposal. So like maybe the scikit-learn pipeline equivalent. And we have one. And you see, for example, in action with linear models, we do not, uh, this is where a bit start to diverge from scikit-learn, but in a lighter sense with a thinner layer of abstractions on top, if we can say so, because we're using polars under the hood all the time. We're not just converting to pandas or to NumPy right until the model.fit call. So this is all porous, and this is you will see that it's blazing very fast because of that. From fun time, we can import the linear models and some processing utilities. So for example, scaling function, uh, creating Fourier terms or rolled windows, and adding calendar effects, for example. And we can define, we can give them an alias, create an instance of those, or just create a list of those, which is not, this, not the case here, but you can do that. You can create a list of transformers that you can even can you can pass when you define your model instance. So we do not have a pipeline, but we do have a forecasting interface that takes in the target transform and the feature transforms that you can use to um, include the transformation in the forecaster. And this is where we divert the biggest from from second learn. We do not have we do not have to call an external function to cross validate. We offer those, but we offer a backtest method, which is a cross validation for time series. Another way to say that that works on the data. And here, for example, we pass a bunch of parameters, so train the data on 15 years on five different splits, and it just takes three seconds to run on this set. And then again, we have a function to plot the backtests so that you can see those and see how they behave and zoom in. But we also have functions to, for example, rank the residuals of these forecasts so that we can see how the model behaves and which are the worst offenders among time series data and how we can improve models. And this is well and good. And for example, we can do the same with gradient boosting and diagnostics. And this is all well and good. And you will see that this is a little bit, behaves very differently from the linear model. So how do we compare forecasts? Well, this is a really interesting uh, question that we solve uh, using some special plots that basically plot a scatter plot of forecasters all together. And you will see this plot of forecast value added that benchmarks a model against uh, um, the predictions, the prediction of a model against the prediction of a naive model and computes an error metric, for example, with the symmetric mean absolute percentage error, which is a bit controversial, but just to make a point here. And along this line, you will see basically where the, if the points uh, line along this line will mean that uh, the behavior of your forecaster is the same as the naive one. And if they go up here, for example, you see that the benchmark, so uh, your naive forecaster has like a lower error than your forecasting model. Which means that in our case, this was the large gradient boosted model. It can perform even worse than a linear model. And if, and if we did the same for the time for the linear model, we see that the linear model excels. This is due to many things: the data set being small, the feature engineering being clever. But the point is, you don't have to use um, this kind of. You don't always have to go for a gradient boosted method to achieve decent performances. And these are the functions that we strive to give you, so that you can do an efficient forecasting process. So uh, this was the toughest bit, and I'm glad that we got it through. And I hope this part of curiosity. Please feel free to uh, connect to the library. Um, I, before leaving, though, I'd like to give you a couple of uh, references and a couple of things that I uh, shout out to a couple of features that I could not display. The first one being that we do implement prediction intervals with conformal prediction, basically, um, which is an implementation of a method that comes out straight to scientific literature. Um, so you can call formalize and generate in prediction interval for your forecasters. We also offer hyperparameter tuning with Flamel, which is a library by Microsoft. And we also offer better advanced feature extraction method than the one we offer. And you and Christopher and Matthew will show them to you in a couple of days. We also support sensor forecasts. So for example, we fit basically two forecaster, one that predicts uh, when um, a va forecast value would be zero, and then we'll fit a regression model in a case it isn't. So this is especially used when you have intermittent data. And we also have an integration with uh, OpenAI to uh, and guide you through the analysis of your data set. And here is the, the interesting part for those of you who want to know more. So uh, these are a couple of talks.
that you might want to look at. Um, the one, the first one is was given a EuroPython t-shirt from Alessandro Molina, who is a senior uh, director of open source engineering at Voltron Data, the guys that maintain basically Apache Arrow. Um, he really goes into the details of the whole Arrow format. Really recommend it if you want to understand what is going on in not only in data engineering, but then there is a talk by Richie Ving, the creator of Polars and the last New York uh, City by, the, by data in New York City, if you want to understand how the engine works. And then another talk by myself, which I gave like um, at PyCon Italy this year, but also at PyCon Portugal about um, going to the bit more on, on the grammar and the API of Polars, which is a wonderful library at this you use regardless, even if you're not interested in two time series, any workflow that you do, even exploratory data analysis on small data sets, you will love using Polars for that. Talking about polars, there is a couple of applications from Marco Gorelli, maintainer of pandas and polars, who spoke like I think a couple of um, talks before me, where he showed how to use polars to handle um, time series data, especially with time, date times and time zones, which are really pesky. So this is the magic that goes under the hood. So um, it, it's great for you to know how to use polars to understand how cleverly Funtime can be implemented and how this can be extended to other data science libraries as well. Finally, the talk by Christopher and Matthew will be coming up in the next couple of days. And that being said, I think uh, you can find a lot of references, a really welcoming community. I can't talk for funk time, but I will be biased, but um, Polars is really great. It's one of the best Python communities I found. They're really helpful. They're really nice. Richie is always so good and is always so responsive and always answers. So please do check them out. Uh, they really have great resources and uh, they will try to answer all of your questions. That being said, I will thank you for attending and I will take all the questions. But for the meantime, I'm really glad to connect with you if you have any feedback to share on how I can improve, but also fun time can improve. So please reach out, just write a message and say, okay, look, I'll uh, ask feature things or two about fun time. Or just feel free to open an issue. We're ready to ask for your feedback. Really love to uh, accept new feature requests or even new contributors or comments on how to extend the documentation. So that being said, I think I can take some questions if there are any. And thank you very much for your time. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we oh, do have a you. question from the Q&A section. Are yes, there do. plans to implement conformal predictions or probabilistic predictions in fun time? We have like one minute. Oh we yes, uh, we, have, we do have one now. We do not have probabilistic forecasts, but we will implement those. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank, thank you everyone. So much. Please share your slides on Discord if you haven't already. Um, oh, yes, I will definitely do it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank for you watching. very much. Bye. Ciao. <laughs>